but I mean, an ACT score could end up paying you, right? So you never, you never know. Um, but, but yeah, props to you guys. We're going to go ahead and get started. So I am going to just share my screen real quick. Um, you guys feel free to cameras on cameras off. I don't care. Just feel free to jump in and just kind of cut me off. That's just kind of the awkward nature of zoom. So just if you have a question or clarification on anything that I'm talking about, just feel free to um, To just unmute yourself and just jump in, even if I'm mid sentence. Right. That's just kind of how these things how these things work. And we've got high schools from all over. I believe, right? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and like give a shout out for their school? Wasatch High School. Wasatch. Okay, Maybe my husband. My husband's a teacher at Timpanogos Middle. So I'm from Timpanogos. Probably you can suck it. Timpanogos. I'll ignore can't, can't, that. Like the part. Maybe a little too harsh. <laughs> anyone else want to have a shout out to their school? Wasatch. Yeah. Oh, can't go wrong with being a wasp. Wasatch wasps. That's right. Yep. We, my, husband was, look, my husband co um, helped coach lacrosse at Wasatch High for a while. And when I would go to his games, it was always like a tongue twister because I was like, Wasatch wasps. <laughs> and like the S's at the end, it was always kind of funny getting. They tongue. come up with lots of, lots of songs. Yeah. And cheers. Yep. Yep. All right, so Wasatch High, Timview. There was another one that sounded a little kind of slow. Anyone else want to shout out? That's fine. It's Saturday. Maple Mountain <laughs> Golden Eagles for the win. Eagle Mountain, is that what I heard? Maple Mountain. Like Maple really Mountain, awesome. Maple Mountain. Yeah. That, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, when you have like a processing speed of like zero. Yep. Hopefully I mean, she can hear us. East High. Okay, now I'm seeing some come up in the chat. Mexico. Dang. East High. Cool. Yeah, you guys are from all over. West. Awesome. Maple Mountain again. Springville. Westlake. Okay, PG. Cool. Now they're all coming in. I should have opened the chat earlier. Timpanogos, Orem. Yeah, you guys are all over. This is awesome. Cool. Well, you guys get to hear from three Provo High teachers today. That's kind of fun. Um, I think P Helen's just worked with Provo High for so long. And so we've been, we've been doing this. I think this is the third year that I've done ACT prep with, with Gear Up. So this is kind of fun. All right. Well, let's just jump in. We are talking about reading. So this is the reading section. And then you guys will see me again later today. I'll be doing the English as well, which English is more of the grammar type like sentence like tweaking sentences and correcting grammar in sentences that one typically um is a little bit harder for my students but just kind of keep that in mind if you want to join the english one and then i'm also doing the like what to expect on test day and just kind of overall act strategies that you can apply to all four sections and that'll be what where we end today so both of those sessions so you guys will hear from me three times today so buckle in i guess um but let's go ahead and start with um reading that's what this session is and i'll pull up my powerpoint and get that going for you guys all right Okay, so the reading section, this is kind of a breakdown for you. Hopefully our videos don't cut off too much of this. So these are the different types of reading passages that you'll have in the reading section. Also, I always send these PowerPoints to Helen. So, and I've told her, they're, they're just mine. I've created them completely. So I'm allowed to share them with whoever I want. So you guys will have access to this. You just have to ask Helen. So taking notes, I think will be helpful. The, the physical movement of like your handwriting things down actually commits a lot of things to your brain, even if you never look at your notes again. So if you'd like to take notes, great. But just so you know, all of the PowerPoints that I use today, um, Hel Helen can give you if you if you want them. So we've got four sections um, in the reading section. Um, and each of those four different types of reading passages are all a little bit different, but they're weighted completely the same. They're all 25%, the same amount of questions. Um, so we've got 40 questions. So you'll have 10 questions per section, and then you have 35 minutes 
um, to answer. Now, this is a section that timing wise, which we'll talk about more, um, is tricky. That um, depending on how quick of a reader you are, which I am not a quick reader and I'm an English teacher, um, can, can make this section a lot more difficult and challenging because ACT is a time game, right? So I'll give you kind of some strategies for that. This is a section, um, even more so than the English, I would suggest that would be worth doing a practice test um, just for the sake of time. Um, you're gonna want to know how short this section is gonna feel for you specifically. So um, it would be my advice that if you're gonna do a practice, section um even if you feel like english is your strong suit um but if you know maybe you're not a super fast reader this would be one that would be worth just and it's 35 minutes it's short right so just set a timer for 30 minutes do the practice test when your timer goes off give you five more minutes so you have that five minutes left um because that's what they give you in the act they give you a five minute warning at the end of every section and this would be one that would be worth doing that for so we're going to break down each one of these different types of passages so you you kind of know what to expect as we go through. This just gives you kind of an idea of the types of questions. Again, you guys can see this in, in your practice tests, but um, a lot of it gives you the lines to refer back to. I wanted you to see that, which is kind of nice. If you see in, these sec in some of these questions, in the parentheses, it says lines one to 21 or lines two, 22. Um, let's see if I can get, I think I can, yeah. Let's do this, right? So lines 22 to 44, lines one to 21. So that's helpful um, because all the past, the reading passages will be numbered. And so you can just jump exactly to where the, where the answer is, but it still is a range as you can see, right? It still is about a 20 line range. Um, this one's a little different, right? Is then line 14, they give you the specific line, right? It says, what do you think this word means in that context? And so basically you'll read it the passage, and then you'll have 10 questions about each passage at the end, all right? So that's kind of what the reading section looks like. So your first reading passage on every ACT test, the first reading passage is always what ACT defines as prose. And how ACT defines prose is a little bit different than like the dictionary definition of prose, um, but that's what, that's what they call it. And it's basically a fictional story or some type of memoir. So memoir is like a true story, like a chunk of an autobiography is kind of how to think of a memoir. And these are kind of like the stories that you get in your English class. Um, and so it'll have a plot, it'll have characters, it'll have different literary devices and metaphors and things like that. But for some reason, and I'm not sure why, not all of my English students agree with this, but statistically ACT has said this is usually the hardest passage, which is interesting because you're exposed to these types of reading passages all through English, um, through junior high and high school, but this one's a little tricky. And um, partially it's tricky because of this third bu bullet point here is that a fictional story and a memoir are usually always too long to have the ACT put the full passage. And so they just like drop you in the middle of it. So sometimes they'll like cut out some of the introduction and cut out some of the ending. And so you're not able to really see the whole passage. You're just seeing a part of it and that can make comprehension a little bit harder. So that's um, why a lot of people, and what makes sense to me, even me personally, as a reader, why that would be a little more, more difficult. So even though they're kind of a personal narrative, which you guys have probably written a lot in, in high school, because that's part of the common core. Um, and so it's the, the text you're familiar with, but it's because they cut a bunch of stuff out to make the passage the perfect length for ACT. And that makes it hard. But it's the kind of text that you want to pay attention to the themes that they're trying to teach, right? The lessons that the author wants you to learn by this chunk in the passage, the relationships between the people, whether they're characters or whether they're actual people from a memoir, the tone, right? Is this like a sad story? Is this kind of heavy? Is there some humor in it? What's the intent? What do they want me to learn and get out of this? And then for this type of um, passage, the prose, which is always the first one in the test, they have a lot of questions about what the author would disagree with or agree with. So they'll have just like statements. And there's one of those questions in almost every prose section of do you think the author would agree with this, 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 or this? And you're supposed to like know what the author's beliefs are regarding that um, question. 
clear enough to be able to narrow that down. So um, that's a really, really common type of question in the reading section, but specifically in prose. So that kind of gives you an idea. And again, this is always the first, they never change the order. So you always know prose is going to be the first, which is important and I'll get back to that a little later. The second reading passage is um, social science, all right? And this encompasses a lot of things. This is like essays on sociology, which is a really fun class in college, by the way. It's just like the study of like social interaction between human beings. So they talk about a lot of like psychology and stuff like that. Um, but there's also social sciences are considered education. So it could be an article or an essay about some new technology in education or some um, way of punishing kids and sending kids to the main office is outdated and realized affects kids mental health in a way we didn't or something right it'll be some type of essay on like the systems and within the education industry and then it could also be psychology and so it's a social science right not like a science it's a little bit different than that so it'll be a lot of essays and kind of research papers written by college professors and stuff like that but um but it's usually these kind of these kind of topics. It's not necessarily about NASA or or, or like an interesting biology study, right? They're still it's it's still different than just science essays. These essays are a little bit more straightforward because they're a little bit more scientific and research based. So this is going to be more kind of like a news article that maybe your English teacher has had you read for like an argument paper or something, right? Um, and so it's a little bit more straightforward. And so sometimes that's easier for kids because they're more familiar with that. Um, you want to pay attention to kind of big ideas, right? What is this article talking about? What's the point they're trying to get across? If it was this new study that they're talking about, well, what was something that the new study found that was worth writing an essay or article about? They have a lot of paraphrasing type questions. So what information they'll take kind of... <clears throat> like a paragraph and ask you to kind of squish that whole paragraph into like one phrase. So like what is the main idea, not of the whole essay, but of this one paragraph is something that they often do. So just kind of paraphrasing and, and kind of saying something a little bit more concise in that regard. Um, it also asks a lot about like the author and what kind of vibes you're getting from them as you're reading the essay. So <clears throat> Is the author really open with their opinion um, about this sociological study or about education, right? Or are they just sticking to the facts? Um, and it'll have you pay attention to that bias because in any type of these articles, people can skew research to say whatever they want, right? Find statistics to argue their point all the time. That's why you have to be really careful. And so that's something that ACT wants to know that you've learned, right? And know that you can pick up on um, an author maybe inappropriately sharing their opinion or even like the certain phrasing and connotation behind certain words that's gonna have certain biases um, behind what they're saying. So again, these should be things that you've been talking about in your English classes. Um, this is all stuff that's in the standards that your English teacher should be teaching. So hopefully you feel like, oh yeah, I've done this. I, my teacher's asked me to think of these similar things and you feel a little bit more prepared for these types of questions. But that's the second passage. It'll always be the second passage and it'll be a social science um, type passage, okay? And these are, those are the things to pay attention to. Then the third passage is what they call humanities. Humanities is kind of like this umbrella. Um, in college, the humanities department is um, art classes and history classes and anthropology and education and English literature. Um, it's kind of just like the studies of the study of like human interaction, which we have in, in literature and education and things like that. So that's how I was thinking. I was thinking of just like human based. Um, and so this encompasses a lot of different things. And so if humanities isn't a word you're familiar with, um, then that's that's kind of where it comes from. So this is going to really include a lot of the type of things that you've read in your English class. Now this is where it gets a little messy because technically a short story and other literary texts is considered prose. So that's why it gets, that's why I'm saying it's ACT's definition of prose and not the definite de dictionary definition because 
prose and a fictional story in a memoir, there's not, it's not super different from like a short story or something. So just kind of be aware of that, where if you feel really comfortable with short stories and kind of breaking down the plot with characters, then maybe you'll get lucky in your first and your third passage will be um, prose, right? But the humanities encompass other things as well. It's not just going to be short stories that um, are like the ones you've read. But it could be an essay about art, about media, philosophy, right? Different ways of kind of seeing the world and, and philosophical paradigms. Um, and so it it's, is a little bit more of an umbrella. But oftentimes, these are going to be the texts that you guys read, have read in your English classes. Short stories, they might vibe a little bit more like a novel, have that kind of tone, that kind of structure, but be a little bit shorter, all right? So similar to the prose section, like your first passage, you also want to pay attention to themes. There's going to be a reason why they chose to write this. Are they wanting to teach you about art? Are they wanting you to think twice about um, media usage and, and the dangers of that, which hopefully that's not what you have on the ACT because that's that gets pounded into you every day. Um, but it's going to be a little different than, than prose. It's just slightly. Um, so the first and third pass passage are going to have similar things. A lot of times they have questions about the point of view of the narrator. Are they, is it, are they sharing it from their experience or their point of view, or are they this narrator that's kind of sitting above um, like a godlike figure, that's, which is called third person omniscient, and they can get into the thoughts and the hearts and the feelings of like all these different characters, right? Or do you have two or three different people sharing their point of view? So again, all of that stuff you should learn about in your English class, right? And should be familiar to you, this is where that's going to pop up on the ACT, is they're going to be wanting you to recognize the type of point of view that they have. And then tone, similar to the prose section, right? What's kind of the vibe, the feeling, the mood? Um, <clears throat> how does the author want you to feel when you're reading their, their writing? And what kind of words and phrases do they use to get you to feel that way, right? This is also going to have a lot more figurative language than prose, and they're going to have questions that are based more on figurative language. So they're going to assume that you kind of know these things. These are the three hard hitters that you probably have learned since like sixth grade, right? Like a similar simile uses like and as, where a metaphor is just a direct um, saying that they're the same comparison. Personification, giving human-like qualities to something that's not human-like, right? Um, these are big ones, and so they're going to want you to recognize that. So sometimes they'll have like an underlined sentence, and then it'll ask you, this is an example of which um, type of figurative language, and then you'll have to kind of pinpoint. So that's something you might want to brush up on and study if that's not something you feel confident in. It won't be a ton of questions, because again, it's going to be mostly for this third passage, but there could be one or two questions in the 10 with the humanities that is really based on figurative language, okay? Then you have your fourth passage, which is natural science. So this is the really like science-y type things that you would be looking through, looking at in your, um, in your science classes in high school. So whenever you are writing an essay or, or anything like that in your science classes, this is going to be, so it's going to be nonfiction, which means it's true. It's real. It's not like a sci-fi story, right? It's nonfiction. It's true. It's real. It's going to be more informational, just trying to like teach you about stuff. Oh, did I lose my laser pointer? Oh, there we go. Um, so it's going to be more informational, just kind of trying to teach you about something. It could be a research study, again, similar to the social sciences, but a different type of research study. But it's all going to be about science. It's going to be about technology. It's going to be about biology, earth science. So um, they do want to make sure that you are comfortable with those types of texts as well. So this is always going to be the fourth passage. So again, if this is something where you're like, uh, this is the type of reading that I struggle with the most, and I already know that about myself, then you'll want to make a mental note of that, that this is your fourth passage, okay? So this is going to be really research-based. It's going to feel really academic. A lot of these types of articles are taking kind of a professor in college that's got to, a few students together with him and they're conducting a research study and then this is their findings. And so a lot of times it'll be like a news article talking about that's, that those findings, but it'll be with a lot of scientific vocabulary and a lot of research-based type language. And that's what makes it tricky for some kids. You really wanna look for specific details um, and that's gonna help you kind of narrow down really what the article's talking about. And then this is almost 
always this question, this bullet point here, this question is almost always paired with your fourth passage, the natural science passage, which is um, which of the following statements is backed up by the blank paragraph. So again, kind of similar to the other passages, you're going to have questions where it's going to ask you to focus like on a paragraph, not the whole article, and it's wanting you to really pull out the important um, ideas in that paragraph. And so again, hopefully this is stuff you've done in your English class, right? Talking about topic sentences, talking about organization of when you're writing your, um, when you're writing your essays. This is where a lot of the writing that you have done in high school comes into play. Um, because yeah, it's the reading section, but a lot of the skills you are taught as a writer are going to be really helpful for um, the reading section of the ACT. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the four different types of passages, okay? And again, they're always gonna be in this order, okay? So first one is always gonna be prose, second one is always gonna be social sciences, humanities, natural science, okay? So um, that's hopefully, that's gonna be good to know for one of the strategies that I talk to you about next, all right? So um, these are kind of the strategies that ACT says works really well and has worked with my students really well, okay? This, it's wrapped around this idea of just knowing what you're good at and maybe what you're not good at as a reader and using those strengths uh, to your advantage, okay? So just like it says here, there are, there's a strategy, and this is why I think it's really important for you guys to do a practice reading test. Because there's a strategy that some people have said really helps them, and it's this idea, this first bullet point here, that most kids have one type of passage out of those four different types that they struggle with the most. So a lot of kids, it's the prose one because they just drop you. Sorry, guys, my lights are, my lights in my classroom are motion censored. So there's no one in here but me because it's a Saturday. So I'm just going to have to like slowly roll my chair back so they can sense that I'm moving when my lights start to turn off. So sorry. Um, but <clears throat> um, now I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. So there's this idea that kids practice and there's one type of passage that they do poorly on more than the others. And um, they've practiced enough to know that. And I don't know if you guys need to do multiple reading section practices, but one I think would be significantly helpful, helpful so you know this. Again, a lot of kids struggle with the prose because they drop you into the middle of the story and then you, you lose some of the context that you need to really comprehend the story fully. Um, but it could be the natural sciences, it could be the humanities, you could think it's going to be one passage, then you take the test and you're like, but this passage was way harder. That's what's, that's why it's good to practice, I think, and know this about yourself. But some um, like ACT researchers have said that this is a good strategy. If you know which one you struggle with, and it's always going to be in the same order, right? Every ACT is going to have the first passage be prose, the second passage be social science. Um, and so forth, right? Then they just say skip it. And if you end up having time, cool, you can go back to it, right? But you don't have to, to read the passages in order. Now on the ACT, you have to read, you have to take the sections in order. So you can't jump back to math once you've started reading, right? You have to stay within that section. But within the reading section, you're welcome to bounce around. So um, this is kind of the strategy that they say. So you figure out which one you know you're maybe not the strongest reader in because of the type of text you're reading and having to really understand well. So you just skip that one. You have like a blank chunk of answers on your answer sheet of 10 questions. Make sure you don't get off, right? And then you just move past that one that's your difficult one and move forward. So that's kind of what this is saying. So you come back, um, but you could also just use your letter of the day, which I'll be talking about later um, this afternoon. So some, if you break down the math, there's nine minutes per section in the reading um, if you do all sections. And that's, I think, estimated. It's like rounded a little bit. Um, and that's not much time to read the passage and answer 10 questions, okay? Um, that moves fast. 
this is a section that I have very few students in my English class because I have my I have my students do practice tests in my class after we talk about it and I have very few students who are like oh I had plenty of time in the reading section that like never happens I always will like give them their five minute warning as a class um, at the, when there's five minutes left of the reading section and like almost all of my kids every year every class period will just like pop their head up and be like wait what like I only have five minutes left so just prepare for that, right? Just know that this is a section that a lot of kids, because you have to read the passage and answer 10 questions and do that four times, the time moves quickly. So the idea is if you're skipping one section, um, you will have 12 minutes per section. Now that's if you're skipping a section completely, like 100%, you don't even read that fourth passage and you don't even try and answer the questions, right? So you like spend no time. Um, but the idea is you figure out which passage is the most difficult for you, you save it for last because whichever passage you read and answer questions for last is probably the one where you're gonna lose time, right? You're not going to have enough time to answer all of the questions for that passage. So it's this idea of knowing your strengths, right? Knowing that, hey, the natural science is the one I'm always going to struggle with the most. And guess what? That's always the fourth passage. So I'm just going to go through the reading section in order and not worry if the natural science um, passage questions I don't answer fully, right? Um, whatever, like I probably wouldn't get them right, all right anyway. That's kind of the idea. But if it's not the natural science and it doesn't come forth, right, then you want to know what that is. Maybe it's the prose because that's what students typically struggle on. So maybe the first passage that's prose, you skip completely. And then you go to passage two, three, and four, and then kind of looking at what time you have left, you go back to prose and do your best to answer a few of the prose questions, right? You just want to be really careful with your Scantron to not get it off, right? If that's what you're going to do, you want to make sure you're not bubbling in on the wrong numbers. But this is a strategy for reading that for a lot of kids is really helpful. And who knows, like maybe you're gonna be one of those kids who is gonna surprise yourself and you are gonna be one of the handful of kids like my students in my classroom. I keep pointing to my desks in my classroom even though you guys can't see them. Um, but maybe you'll be like one of those kids where you're like, Miss Tyra, the reading section wasn't that bad. You know, like that might be you, you might surprise yourself. But either way, by doing a practice test on your own, it's only 35 minutes. That's what you're gonna learn about yourself, okay? Here's another strategy, no matter what you do regarding the passages and the order and the skipping one or not, but it's been proven, a lot of the research shows that if you don't read the passage first, if you jump to the questions, you don't read the answers of the questions, but you just quickly skim those 10 questions regarding the passage and you read those first, um, and then you go back to the passage, then those questions are in your brain, right? And you know when you're reading the short passage what those questions are going to be, and then you kind of can flag things, and, and your mind is just is more prepared and ready to answer the questions, and it's just going to save you time, which in this section you need, right? Um, so that's a huge strategy. Yes, it takes a little bit longer because you're technically like reading the questions twice, right? But the first time you don't have to fully read them, just kind of skim them, get a rough idea of what types of questions they are. But research shows that even though it takes a little bit more time, it actually saves kids time in the end. And they also are way more likely to get the questions right whenever they do that. So that would be something I would really recommend um, and, and trying out when you do your practice test, okay? Also, they say you don't have to carefully read the entire section. You need to read the entire section, but um, because they don't give you a ton of time, the questions are not gonna be like super hidden and difficult and challenging. They're not trying to kind of like bury one of these sentences, you know, in like a really abstract, confusing way. Um, you should be able to read it pretty quickly and um, do some like, not, not fully skimming, maybe more than skimming, but you don't have to like read every word and like have a paper and like slide down and make sure you read every word carefully. The texts are not gonna be that difficult. They're not gonna be like you read a paragraph and you're like, what did I just read? They're not gonna be that hard. Um, for most of you. And so just don't spend too much time reading through it. Don't read too carefully, okay? Then you'll wanna look for keywords. 
All right, so if there's a keyword in the question, right, there's a question that's asking you, right, like we saw in the example, in line 14, the author talks about, I don't know, watermelon, okay. <laughs> Um, and then you're going to make a mental note like, oh, there's a watermelon question. When I'm going to go back and read the passage, I'm going to look for watermelon. And if you're taking the written test, you can even make a note. You can like make a tick mark or circle watermelon because then you know you're going to have to go back to that watermelon area of the passage and reread it to answer your question, right? So you'll want to look for any of those keywords that stand out if they give you any quotes. We can go back. Let me click back. Yeah, so here we go. And let's, we can see if there's, um, there's any ones. So this is um, telling me that I'm screen sharing. So it's cutting it off just a little bit at the top of my screen for me, but hopefully you guys can see it up here. It says the comparison of artist to fruits. So that would be one for me. I'm like fruits, artist and fruits. Like, oh, that's kind of weird, right? So then I would, while I, when, it, when I go back to read the passage that these questions go to, I would be looking for any time they mention fruits right? And I would just circle. Maybe that's where I got watermelon from. <laughs> it's like, I've done this, this ACT prep before, but I would be looking for that, right? That's what I kind of mean by looking for keywords. Just make a mental note when you're reading the questions before you go back. So here we go. Um, and then this, this is a little tricky. This is, I think, worth trying and see if it works for you, but this is one of those strategies that... <clears throat> depending on what type of learner you are and depending on what type of reader you are, might not be super helpful, but it's something worth trying if you're nervous about the reading section, okay? And it says, answer the question in your head before you answer, before you read the answers that are written out. So for example, maybe I need to put this picture back in my slide. Um, <clears throat> so um, this would say, which of the following is the best title for this passage? right? I would like not even look. I would like cover it up, maybe even A, B, C, and D, and think what title would I give it? Or what type of words or ideas would I think should be in the title? And then the idea is you're looking for an answer that matches with what popped it up in your head. Now, this strategy helps you not be tricked, okay? Sometimes ACT purposely puts misleading. Oh, guys, this makes me so mad even saying this, but it's true. They purposely put misleading answers um, in. And so this is a strategy that's trying to get you away from, from falling for that. So this idea of answering it in your head means that you're not going to be tripped up by some of those tricky answers that they're giving you that they know are tricky, that, that kids choose as the right answer all the time because it's close enough, right? But in reality, it's the wrong answer. So that's what that strategy is trying to kind of save you from, right? And then I know um, that some of you guys take, have, take the ACT online. My Provo High has never done it that way. And when I took the ACT in high school, it was always written. So this might not apply all to all of you, but if you can, studies have also shown that kids who practice annotation in their English classes and get good at like making act physical actual notes on what they're reading, and then if they implement that strategy on the ACT, those kids tend to do better on the reading section, all right? So maybe it's your English teachers in the past have called it annotation, maybe they've called it close reading, maybe they've called it having a conversation with the text, okay? Whatever they've called it. When you make notes and underline and circle and write things in the margins off to the side and you're writing that on the actual paper or book that you are reading, that's annotation and that could help you in the reading section. So just keep that in mind as well as a strategy, all right? So these are all strategies that are worth trying, worth thinking about, keeping in mind, um, whenever you're, whenever you're doing the, the reading section. Okay. Now there is a study that specifically for the reading section, um, that has said that when these words are in the answer, they are like never the right answer. Okay. And it's this idea that these are really extreme words, right? Um, this is 
always the case. This is never, this will happen if this happens, right? It must be this way, unquestionably. They're so precise and extreme that they often don't apply in an English world. And I think about this in the way that, this is what I love about being an English teacher, where you can just like BS your way through an essay, right? Like it doesn't, like your English teacher is never looking for like the right thing because there's lots of right things if you can argue it well enough, you know? And that's what I like about English is that there's no, no right answer. Um, there's multiple right answers, right? And so that's what I think this is getting at. Whereas you guys are going to be reading passages and texts that are going to leave wiggle room um, in the idea. And man, you should probably look up a, an example of, of these types of questions so you can kind of see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Maybe I'll look that up while you guys are at lunch. Um, but the research shows, just looking at the numbers and the data, I'm kind of getting into the philosophy behind this idea. But looking at the numbers looking at the data of ACT reading questions and what are typically not the right answer, anytime they have this word, just think twice about it because it's a very high chance that if there are any of these five words in the answer, it's the wrong answer, okay? Because they're gonna leave a little bit more wiggle room, okay? I'm worried that I'm finishing early, I am. The reading section, guys, I just can't stress enough. There's, it's hard for me every time I think, and Helen can maybe attest to this, that I finish early with the reading section. My English section, I never do. But I finish early with the reading section because so much of it is you guys just getting in and trying it out, okay? Um, that is just a huge, a huge part of it. So just to remember, I'll click back to my first slide. Just remember, you've got these four different types of passages. And you knowing which one you struggle with the most is going to be important for you saving that for last. All right. And um, because that's the one that you might not have time to answer fully. And then the idea of reading the questions first and then going back to the passage, that's important too. That would be the one strategy where I'm like, everyone should probably do that because the studies and the, and the statistics just show that so many kids do better on the reading section when they read the questions quickly first and then they go to the passage and it trains your brain, right? It gives you a roadmap of what to pay attention to while you're reading, which is nice to have in, in this section. So um, I guess I'll just open it up for questions. If you guys have questions about the reading section, questions about anything that I've touched on, something that was confusing that maybe you didn't understand and I'll make sure. Um, let me see if I can see the chat while I'm sharing my screen. I might not be able to, so we'll go back here. But go ahead and unmute yourself if you guys have questions. I'll open up the chat. Um, oh, okay, here's a question. It says, do we write an essay in the English section or in the reading section? That's a really good question. So the writing section is actually an optional section. So um, you don't have to take the writing section if you don't want to. Um, should you take it? I think it depends on you. If you think, I mean, so the ACT has four different sections, right? Math, science, reading, and English. Um, colleges don't necessarily ask for it, no. Um, but in the, and the writing is the fifth section. So if you know you're a strong writer and that's something you have an English teachers tell you, like, or that think you've gotten good grades, on your essays in the past, right, then that's a whole entire fifth score that could balance out these other four scores, right? Um, and so if you know you're a good writer and you're worried about your math score, if you get a, a higher, even by one point or two points higher on your reading score than you do on your math, it's going to take your overall score and jump it up. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Now, Provo High School, we use the ACT as like state testing. So that means that um, our 11th graders never have to take st state testing and we use the ACT score. And so because of that, our district wants to know and have data and test scores and numbers on our 11th graders um, 
writing ability. And yeah, you guys are right. I'm sorry. I'm trying to like read your guys's comments. That's really helpful. Your writing score could hurt you. Yeah, it really could. If, if you know that you're writing, like you are not a strong writer and you could potentially get low, like a lower score on your writing section than any of the other four, then yeah, like don't take it. Right. So that's it. That's exactly right. Um, but Provo High School, the free ACT that we offer um, in school, which probably a lot of your schools do, we require to take the writing course. Um, and so some of you will take the writing no matter what, um, but you do get two scores. You get a score that takes the math, science, English, reading, and writing, adds that all together, divides it by five in that score, but it'll also take the writing out online and it'll give you just the four without the writing add those together, divide it by four. So you can kind of choose which, which score you want to send. Um, and it, they try and give you some options like that because the writing is optional, but for some kids, they're, if you're taking it at your high school and that's your only shot and you, you don't plan to take it again or it's just too expensive because it is expensive, like it's not optional for those kids. They were forced to take the writing section. So that's how they try and keep it fair is they allow you to keep or take out your writing score in your in your composite. So even if you just want to like take a stab at it, at it, if your if your school doesn't require you to take the writing section, but you're just like I'm not a terrible writer, like I'll try. It does give you the option of taking that writing section out of your averaged score. Does that make sense? So um, yeah, the writing section. I was let me see if da, 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 how hard is the essay? Yeah, you can hide your writing if it was bad. That's what I've been told. And that was not the way it was in, when I was in high school, but they've switched that now. So um, the writing section is difficult. It's unlike any essay you guys have really do in high school. It's a different type of essay. Oh, there goes my light again. Hang on. There we go. Um, it's a different type of essay. It's not technically argumentative. It's not fully like an informational essay where I'm gonna tell you about something. It's not a personal narrative. It's probably closest to argument writing, which I think you guys are most familiar with, but they really want your opinion in it. So that's where it's like not argument writing at all. Because in high school, it's like, I don't want to care. I don't want what you think or what you, you know, I just want the research. I just want the data, right? That's what your English teachers have always taught. So it's different, um, a little bit of that. Some kid here says, um, I think it's easier than the AP writing test. That's good to know. I, I haven't taken that for years and I've never taught AP. So that's good to know for you guys. Um, junior year, I take the pre-ACT, take the ACT. Yeah, so you guys are you guys are getting it. Um, wait, so you can take the writing section out of your score. Yeah, that's what I've heard. So, and that was a recent change that they made, like in the last year or two. So, um, yeah, good. I just had just had Tannen confirm that for me. But yeah, that's what um, that's what I've been told is that was a recent change that they made. That because the writing is optional, you can just choose to take it out of your average score if you don't do well on it. And that's kind of nice because you can kind of see if it ends up boosting you up or not. And that's part of the reason that I don't think Helen has had um, the writing be part of this practice. Um, but the PowerPoint that I'm going to send her is going to have my slides about the writing section because I tell I teach my kids about it because they're they're all going to have to take it. So I might as well talk about it a little bit. So if you guys want, um, it's not three essays; it's just one, um, and so that's good. Um, it takes a little bit shorter. How do you take it out? I think the website just does it automatically or you can like click a button and then it re kind of calibrates it, but it's just done online when they report your score. They'll have one score that includes the writing and one score that doesn't and then you can kind of choose which one to send to, um, to universities. So I would say the writing section is a good idea um, if you know that it could potentially help your overall score, right? If you think there's even a chance that your writing score could be better than your science, math, English, or reading score, then take the writing section. But if you are one of those kids, you guys know you, right? Like you know what type of student you are. And if you know that writing has never been a strength, it's always been a weakness, um, then I wouldn't take the writing section. Just you're already going to be stressed enough. Like just be done. It's an extra 40 minutes on your test. Like you don't have to take it, right? But it is an option for kids if if they want to boost their score a little bit, but it might not boost everyone's score, right? 
So let me see, depends on the class. ACT is easier than AP. I think that's true. The problem with, AC, the, with AP classes, especially junior year AP classes, is those junior year AP, AP Lang is 100% focused on writing. So an entire year, you're focused on nothing but writing. So the AP test requires, I think, a lot more of you where the ACT is a little bit different. It's just one essay. Um, yeah, never more than you have to. That's my motto. That's a good, good idea. So yeah, recap. If you are okay at writing, take the writing. Yes. If you suck, don't do it. It can hurt you. Perfect, Kristen. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, a lot of colleges require it. I don't know. Maybe that's the case, Katie. That's not something that I have found um, in my experience. So that might be worth looking up. Um, I know that multiple I don't know. I know UVU for sure, but I know there's other big Utah universities that don't require the writing because it's optional. Um, so that might just be looking up your college and, and making sure that is something that would definitely be like very clearly and obviously on their website. So if you're looking up the college and going to their admissions page, um, that it would it would it would be on there. They would have that like in bold letters, very obvious, right? You must take the writing because it's ACT says it's optional. So if a university is requiring that, um, that way, yeah, it used to be used the ACT, the SAT. That's a good point, Helen. I've heard that too. So the SAT is a test that a lot of East Coast schools use, and it does have a writing comp component that's not optional. And so some universities will say, well, if you took the ACT with the writing, then you don't have to take the SAT. Um, I've heard that too, Helen. That's a good point to to bring up. Do -do -do. Do you think you can change it? Maybe Bianca, just go online, see if you can, send them an email. Helen can maybe help you help you do that. Um, Stanford, yeah, more, more competitive schools might require it. I would just go to their website um, and ask. And yeah, Bianca, just, I would just go online and see if there's an option. If it's not easy to check your online to add the writing, then, um, then, I, then Helen can help you get in touch with maybe an email or a phone number that you can call and they might be able to manually change that. Um, for you. It just depends. It depends on like the, the spot that you registered for the ACT, that testing location might um, have all of the writing supplies. They might have the writing test book booklets. They might have all of the, the proctors are planning to stay an extra 40 minutes to proctor the writing section, but they might not. So depending on where you chose to take the ACT, it might be an easy change where it's like, yeah, we have a, this classroom is all staying here an extra 40 minutes for the writing. We'll just make sure we have a booklet for you. Or they might say, actually, we don't have a proctor in place to stay that long. And we, we didn't even order any of the writing booklets from ACT. So that I think it would just depend um, on the location that you signed up, if that's going to be an easy switch or not. So that's why I would call them. Which is more prevalent, ACT or SAT? Um, that's tricky. My gut wants to say ACT, but I really do think it's like a West Coast, East Coast thing. Um, the majority of universities in the U.S. are in the East Coast, and that's just because the East Coast is older, right? Like the our, when our when the U.S. was a super young country, there were cities and people populating. Um, you know, all the way up the East Coast, and then we slowly moved West, right? So majority of universities are in the East Coast, but California schools, Oregon schools, Utah schools, like all of the West side of the U.S. will accept the ACT. There's not going to be a school that says only SAT if they're not on the East Coast. So it just depends on where you want to go to school. And the SAT is very different from the ACT. It's scored differently. The sections are different. So if that is something that you have a dream school and they need the SAT, you want to figure out if they'll count the ACT or if you need to take the SAT because the SAT is very different and scored very differently. Okay, so let's see. West Coast, ACT, East Coast, SAT. That's perfectly right. Do you need to take the SAT? If you're not planning to apply to East Coast schools, nope. You don't. Explain the difference between ACT and SAT. I don't know a whole lot. Oh, there goes my lights again. Okay. Um, I don't know a whole lot. I didn't go to school there. I lived in South Carolina for a few years, but um, after my freshman year of high school, we left and I've been in the West ever since. But the biggest thing I do know is um, the SAT 
you get penalized, which I'll talk about this this afternoon again. Um, but the SAT, for every wrong answer, they take off 0.25 points. So if so on the SAT, they say, do not answer any questions unless you know it's the right answer. And so the SAT, they say, just like leave answers blank because the wrong ones you get penalized for on your score. But the ACT is the opposite. The ACT, you get no penalty for guesses. And so that's a strategy I'll be talking about later this afternoon. That's the biggest one. I need a robot. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Um, but that's the biggest difference that I know. It's also a different score. Like the ACT is out of 36 and the SAT, I think, is out of like 1,400. So like 1,400 or something like that. So like the scoring is, is completely different as well. The types of questions are a little different. So yeah, 1,600, thank you. See, I've never, I've never taken it or taught any prep for it or anything. Yeah, so 1,600. So the scoring is way different as well. All right, any other questions you guys have about the reading? We'll be getting into a lot of ACT strategies, how the ACT is scored, how they, I'll be talking about a lot more about that specifically this afternoon, but anything else about the writing or the reading section that you guys have questions about? Okay, hopefully that gave you some things to think about. Again, my biggest advice would just be give yourself 35 minutes, not today, obviously, because you guys are gonna be burnt out, but I would think, I would say that the writing section is worth doing a practice test on your own because um, you wanna know how, how quick the time goes, essentially for you as a reader. ACT questions, let's save that. Um, I'm going to be doing your guys like an overall ACT prep for you guys. So um, was it Isaac? Oh, no, it wasn't Isaac. Dennis. Dennis, we'll get save that question, jot it down in front of you, and then make sure you bring it up this afternoon after I teach the English stuff. Okay? It looks like they're hungry. I know. I think they're, I think they're ready. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Jesse, and we'll see you back this afternoon, and all yeah. of you guys can uh, leave this, this breakout room. And then we'll meet back at 1240. Well, that's when we'll start, so don't be late. You can leave yourself in that main room. You don't have to log out, just leave it there. You can mute your video and your sound, go eat some lunch, go run around, do whatever you need, and then we'll start at 1240. I know it's lunch is 20 minutes, but you actually get about 20. Five, 26 minutes. There we go. And then I'll see you guys, I'll see you guys later this afternoon. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Yep. See you guys.